Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order so we can get started. And I'm going to ask everyone to please rise to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, Mrs. Sugars, can you please call the roll? Mrs. Stratton. Mrs. Fleischer. Here. Mrs. Gallagher. Here. Mr. Greenbaum. Mr. Mayor. Dr. Rood. Here. Mrs. Tong. Here. Mrs. Winters. Here. Ms. Stern. Here. Okay, we're very excited tonight to start our meeting with board recognition. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Morton. Thank you very much, Mrs. Stern. I've been looking forward to this, uh, this, this recognition for quite some time now. We have an opportunity to recognize the Cherry Hill Atlantic 16U Youth Baseball Team, team that, that captivated the hearts of all of us in Cherry Hill and all of us around this entire country, uh, quite frankly, this summer. So I'm gonna ask Ms. Wilson to join me at the podium and we will distribute certificates to these young people. Okay, so I'm going to ask Coach Karki to come on up to say a few words. And um, we also wanted to mention that assistant coaches Chandler Dunoff and Benjamin Keating were part of this effort as well. Um, so Coach Car Creek, come on up. I want to thank everybody for having us. Um, it's been a surreal wild ride for us, and we really appreciate all the support that uh, that both schools, uh, both or all the organizations, uh, the mayor's office, the council, uh, board of education, you know, so much support in this in this township for what we did this year. And myself, my coaches, the parents, and especially the players really appreciate everything that you guys did to support us. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to say just a few words about the boys. Uh, they put an immense amount of work in, um, really did some uh, major commitment from things that they do normally during the summer. To, to be part of that ride, to be part of something that they're going to have as a memory for the rest of their life that nobody will ever be able to take away that they were the U.S. champions. Um, you know, uh, real kudos to the programs that produce them. Um, Coach Speller, Coach McMaster do great jobs with these boys. Um, and uh, and it's a, it was a real pleasure to coach them all summer. And I can't wait till next year for, for the high school season and for maybe to even do this again. So um, with that, I'm going to call up the boys. Um, first one is not here. He might be watching on Zoom right now. So uh, Andrew Bechtel, Brody Goldfarb, Carter Gill, congratulations, Kyle Fisher, James Farley. Brody Connors, Eric Brown, Luciano Macri, cut your hair too. Stephen Longo is not here today. Austin Haney, Cole Haddock, doesn't say how he is. Mick Goldstein, Ryan Moyer, Kristen Perry, Aiden Ryder, Zachary Salisbury. And for the coaches, Chandler Dunoff, Benjamin Keating, thank you very much for having us. We greatly appreciate it.
Okay, so if I could have the team members and parents meet me out in the front of the school, Mr. Burrell will take you out there. We're going to get a few pictures. It's an opportunity for parents to get pictures as well. Thank you. Fantastic. And as uh, the boys exit, I also want to mention that uh, I learned that they have a GoFundMe uh, that they started in benefit of the victims of the Maui wildfires. Uh, th these young people had an opportunity to play and beat a team from Maui. So their hearts have gone out uh, to the to the victims of the Maui wildfires and the GoFundMe is available. So support if you can. Congratulations. Well done. Teams and students from East and West Side. It's uh, it's just, it's great to see. So thank you. And thank you parents for coming out. Really appreciate uh, how you're supporting the kids. It takes, uh, it takes a village. So we appreciate that. Big village. <laughs> <laughs> a big village with deep pockets, I also think. <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay. And we now... Um, we move along. I do, I do, uh, we have a few, uh, we have a presentation tonight, so we are going to move to that. Uh, so if we could welcome, um, Faith Holmgren and Nora Smaldor, I believe, and Dr. Horton, did I get that right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You, you've gotten that correct. Yes. I'd like to, uh, welcome and, uh, call up Ms. Faith Holmgren. We'll do our NJGPA spring 2023 administration. Uh, presentation board. Ms. Holmgren. Hi. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me um, tonight. It's been a while since I've been up here presenting, um, but I am glad that we are in a quiet space tonight and there's no jackhammers in the back. <laughs> but thank you again for having me. Um, tonight, I will present uh, spring 2023 New Jersey graduation proficiency assessment results, otherwise known as NJGPA. Before we dive in and I begin, I would like to provide you with a few key pieces of information. The spring 2023 results I am presenting tonight will not be compared to the results from spring 2022 NJGPA because the spring 2022 administration of NJGPA was a field test as I mentioned many previous times in my presentation last year. The other reason is because the cut score of what is considered quote unquote graduation ready has changed from 750 for the, two 20, for the 2022 results to 725 for the 2023 results. New Jersey state statute requires this assessment to be administered to all grade 11 students. It is designed to measure the extent to which students are graduation ready in ELA or English language arts and mathematics. The ELA component of the assessment is aligned to grade 10 NJSLS ELA standards or our New, our New Jersey student learning standards. And the math component is aligned to algebra one and geometry, and geometry standards, also those NJSLS standards, which I just referred to. As I mentioned earlier, the proficiency level cut score for ELA and math was revised by the NJDOE on May 3rd, 2023 from 750 to 725. Students who take but do not meet the minimum cut score will have a few options to meet the graduation assessment requirement. They may retake the ELA and or math component this coming fall, which we will offer. They may meet the designated cut score from the menu provided by the DOE of substitute competency tests, or they may complete a portfolio appeal. We're on a slight delay here. Okay, moving on. Now into the data. Here you can find the comparison of our 11th grade Cherry Hill students to the entire state. You will notice 
there are only two categories the students can fall into, graduation ready and not graduation ready. For ELA, 88.5% of our students are considered graduation ready, comparable to 80.5 at the state level. 11.5 of our students are considered not graduation ready for ELA, or for mathematics, I'm sorry, compared to 19.5 for the state. Oh, you know what? We flipped that there, guys. Sorry about that. I'm looking at I'm looking at a different, let me go back here. So if you turn to slide five, so you'll see there for ELA, 88.5% of our students are graduation ready comparable to the state. Not graduation ready, 11.5 comparable to 19.5 and so forth for mathematics, 68.4 comparable to 55% and then 31.6 comparable to 45%. Moving on to slide six, looking at the data for the ELA component of the assessment for our high schools. It is broken down by high school. So you will see here at East, 9.5% of their students are considered graduation, not are considered not graduation ready for ELA, while 90.5 are considered graduation ready. And at West, 13.7 are considered not graduation ready for ELA, while 86.3 are considered graduation ready. And for your review, which I find very important, we have also included the student counts for each of these percentages. Moving on to mathematics results by school. At Cherry Hill High School East, 23% are considered not graduation ready, while 77% are. At High School West, 40.5 are considered not graduation ready, while 59.5 are. On the next two slides, you can find the comparison between the specific high schools and the district as a whole. Here we start with East. As you note, there is both ELA and mathematics included on this side, comparable to the district as a whole. Moving on to slide nine. Here you will find that identical data for West. Moving on to our next slide. Just a quick note here before we proceed. You may find that this presentation is somewhat repetitive or redundant. And as you may know from the past, this is a presentation that we are provided by the NJDOE and that we are required to use when presenting the data to the Board of Education. The final two slides provide you with the NJGPA data by subgroup. This slide provides you with the data with subgroups for race, race, ethnicity for both ELA and mathematics. The graph displayed at the far right of this chart indicates all students, so you are able to see the comparison between the subgroups and all students. Moving on to slide 11, again, looking at our subgroups. The subgroups included on this slide include students with disabilities, English language learners, and, economic, and, and economically disadvantaged. Again, notice the graph on the far right to identify how students in these subgroups performed comparable to all students. I would like to also bring your attention to one more thing. The total number of students that is represented in the ELL category is only 14 students. So while this data may appear concerning, it does only represent 
14 students. And just another side note, we must provide you with the data of 10 students and above. So any of our subgroups that have less than 10 students, we do not provide that subgroup data as we are not required to. Notable achievements, I would like to point out several. For ELA, the district average for students who are graduation ready is above the state average. Students who are identified as economically disadvantaged are performing at three at levels within 3% of the state average. And students with disabilities are performing within 10% of the state average. For mathematics, the district average for students who are graduation ready is above the state average as well. Students who are identified as economically disadvantaged are performing at levels within 5% of the state average in this category. And students with disabilities are performing at levels within 6% of the state average. Finally, I would like to highlight ways in which we are responding to this data. For ELA, we have already begun isolating specific standards in which our students did not perform well and identifying where we need to focus instruction. Our, liter our literacy coaches, technology coach, and colleague teachers will meet with PLC groups or professional learning community groups and individual teachers to provide strategies for instruction in these areas. For mathematics, we are continuing professional development presented by the folks at Great Minds as we did last year as well. For both our teachers and I want to highlight our administrators as well. We are also providing targeted interventions through the algebra seminar course at each of our high schools. This is the conclusion of our presentation this evening. Are there any questions that I can answer? I do apologize for getting mixed up in that first data slide. I'm used to having a large projector in front of me. So a smaller projector kind of made things a little askew, but thank you for bearing with me. That's okay. <laughs> Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you so much, Ms. Holgram. I, I thought it was a great um, presentation, very succinct. Um, and I think this is more for Dr. Um, Morton, uh, the question. Uh, you had the intervention strategies, which I thought was uh, really wonderful. And those are sort of broad strokes. I was wondering as far as identifying the students, because this is from this past spring, correct? That are the juniors that will be seniors this year. And one of, we're talking about our board goals, right? And one of our board goals is really to make sure that, you know, every student graduates um, and we'll get back to that later. But I just wanted to know, are there more specific interventions for students beyond the broad strokes that we talked about tonight? Yes, absolutely. So, so all schools across the district implement um, an intervention referral services uh, process. And within that process, take an individual individualized approach and look at uh, children, their progress, and the needs that they may have in terms of the supports that they may have um, as well. So if a child is identified for the seminar course, they may be within that process, and there'll be specific strategies, specific units of study, and, and things along those lines that teachers actually focus on to help to push them toward the mark. Uh, students who are not graduation ready at this at this time will receive additional opportunities to demonstrate that they are graduation ready um, with the ultimate process ending with the portfolio assessment if need be. Thank you so much. So if some of the students didn't pass and that they're not graduation ready, um, they do have to do an additional step to prove that they are like what you said, like portfolio, is that correct? Absolutely, yes, yes. So, so there are additional opportunities to demonstrate graduation readiness. Yes. Um, and, I, and I can say, you know, one thing that, you know, as, as a district um, that I guess we can hang our hats on is that we have never had a child not graduate for not demonstrating um, that they're graduation ready via the um, 
standardized test assessment. Great, thank you for that information. They have three opportunities. So they're able to reassess if they were not graduation ready in the spring of 2023, they're able to reassess. We are um, providing an administration in the fall. And then um, just following up on what Dr. Morton said. And then the second opportunity is supplemental um, assessments that are provided in a menu by the Department of Education. So we have those supplemental um, assessments as well as cut, cut scores that they must achieve. And then the third opportunity is the portfolio. So that is the final um, and kind of the last opportunity um, to be to demonstrate that their graduation assess, uh, they are ready. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. So as a kind of follow-up question, and this again might be, might be turned to Dr. Morton for this. Um, so, you know, there's a few, obviously a few groups of students who demonstrated more challenges in terms of their uh, results than other students. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about the ELL students, for example. So I actually studied abroad and I, you know, I had, I went during my college years and I had two years of language before I went abroad. And I remember taking the assessment test before, like a pre, we had a pre and a post test. And I didn't understand most of what was said in that, you know, um, in my, my language skills were just far beyond. And it took me, you know, six or eight months and then reassessed and it was a lot better, but I was definitely not, you know, fully fluent, right? Um, despite studying hard and being immersed in a country with a, lang with a foreign language. I'm thinking about, you know, these students who are in this group imagining what it's like to sit down for a, stand, a written standardized test for them that's, you know, this level, um, you know, how challenging it might be. And I, I guess in those, in that lens, I can see why it's so might be very hard for them to pass at a high rate, um, especially depending on when they might've come to this country. And this is, we don't know what kind of language exposure they had to English before coming here. And obviously you have to speak English and read English pretty well to do math as I'm, yes. I've learned from being on the board, right? Um, so can we assume that those students kind of given, you know, I'm trying to conceptualize what's going on here because it's a, it's a concerning number. Can we assume that those students are likely going to do better with a portfolio and other ways to be able to show graduation readiness rather than a kind of a standardized test? I think that, um, so one piece of information that I wanna share with you is any student who has newly arrived um, to our country from June 1st on, so the prior year. So if a student is a junior and entered after June 1st, they will not have to take, they're exempt from taking the ELA portion of this assessment. However, as you noted, they are not exempt from taking either the science or the mathematics assessments which as we know, there is a lot of language um, within both of those assessments as well. So I don't wanna make assumptions that students who um, are ELL students that they would um, maybe do better or have a better chance with one of the alternate pathways, um, but we want to provide them with those alternate pathways in order to make them successful. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, actually, as you were talking, I was thinking about, and you know, we had meetings with Latinx families this past year, and one of the family members we met with specifically talked about state testing and saying, you know, students are allowed to have a dictionary and that's it. And the, the parent said, you know, that does not give the right opportunity for students who are English language learners. It was, you know, it was really something that was very kind of important to hear as part of our meetings, so. Absolutely, and I think what some people don't think about is that students oftentimes can't read in their native language. Um, so we're providing a student with, you know, a dictionary in which they may not be fluent in their native language either, so. And then the other, oh, sorry. Yeah, just to provide some anecdotal information as well as some substance to it, quite a few of the families in this category, of children in this category, do capitalize on portfolio assessments. I can tell you that from firsthand yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that that necessarily has to be the only pathway, but they absolutely have in the past here within the district at our, at our high schools um, taken advantage of the portfolio. Thank you. And then the, the other category that you know we talk about a lot too, and that's also showing up as really struggling. There are quite a few categories of students that are kind of parsed out, and students with disabilities. And I, you know, I'm trying to understand, you know, I mean. It's, 
again, in our goal work with Mrs. Fleischer, I'm looking forward to, <laughs> you know, we have, you know, that's been one of our goals over the past, you know, few years, it's been very, it's been spelled out. So ensuring that those students are successful. Um, but I'm also just wondering, you know, as we look at this, um, you know, we have put, you know, coaches in place, we have a, a special education teacher coach um, that's now uh, in place that we didn't have before. So I'm just wondering too, if there are other um, pieces of information that would help us understand this a little better and, or um, the strategies a little bit more detail on, on thought, you know, thoughts of strategies. Yeah, I think, I think the first thing I, we need to understand um, with this data here is that different groups of kids, you know, they start at different places. And what we are attempting to do is we're trying to individualize our approach in a way that we can um, allow them to attain success and demonstrate success. And we're looking through the lens of growth. So, you know, if a child started at C, we want that child to progress to F or G or H, you know, by the end of the year, that child st shouldn't remain at C um, by the end of the year. So it's about ascertaining how much growth and how many steps is appropriate for each individual child. If a child, um, you know, children at different places, but if one is on grade level, one is not, one is above, we want, we want them to make a commensurate amount of growth. Uh, some need to accelerate growth as well, um, but it's difficult. They may not demonstrate the same level of proficiency, but the, but the key indicator for us is that growth that we demonstrate, that we deem as being uh, appropriate um, for all, all students. I can say like, it's hard to compare these results to last year because of you know the fact that last year was a was a field test, but every subgroup did make growth, um, that, you know as compared to last year. But what we'll do is we'll use this now. We, this is not a field test. This is you know true assessment, and we'll look to make growth and 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 push the, the students forward next year. Dr. Reed, um, so I I think I know the answer from the way the conversation is going, but does the NJ GPA offer any kind of um, uh, translated text or anything for either for the math component? Because you're you're saying that if they uh, like recent rivals don't have to take the the English language, the ELA portion, but they still have to take the math portion. But now they're taking math portion in a language that's not there primary language, is there any translation or anything? For certain languages, not for every language. Okay, so. And um, we are able to provide that to our students based upon what um, the testing publisher provides to us as a, as a, not only a school district, but provides the Department of Education. Thank you. Mrs. Winters. So I just had a few questions about the math curriculum in the high schools and how it aligns with this test. So I know that we just changed our algebra course to Eureka Algebra. That happened, I believe, last year. So that wouldn't be these kids, right? That seeing the, whether that affects how kids are doing on these tests is a few years in the future. I apologize. I'm, I'm unable to answer that question. So I, I'm going to... You're correct. Yes. Okay. And I mean, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was that the Eureka Algebra curriculum seems to be really well aligned with the state standards, which are what's tested on this test. As well as as well as being articulated across the grade levels. So right. from pre-K or K all the way through um, ninth grade or algebra one, let's say. Yeah, so I'm really hopeful that um, that change that we've made with a consistent math curriculum with Eureka Math, and now we're going to Eureka Math squared all the way through K through eighth is going to show benefits to kids because the curriculum is well aligned with the standards, which are what's being tested on the tests. So I'm hoping to see in a few years as that goes forward, we're going to see improvements in the in the math scores. So what I wanted to ask about beyond that was also the geometry component. Um, because there's two pieces, right? So there's the algebra one piece, which then we're remediating through the algebra seminar. But can we parse out whether kids are having trouble with geometry? And if they are, what mechanisms do we have to assist them in understanding that curriculum? Well, I'm not exactly sure if we can, if, if this assessment is diagnostic enough to, you know, break down the, the uh, particular items to provide us with that information. Um, however, we we do have other metrics, you know, internally that we're able to use to identify students who may be in, in need of additional support in geometry. We we do run a parallel geometry seminar type of course as well at the high school, 
level to provide students with additional supports and different additional opportunities to gain proficiency and understanding. Perfect. That's exactly what I thought. Thank you so much for that information. Ms. Gallagher. I was kind of going to ask the same question as Gina or Ms. Winter, sorry. Um, but I guess my question is, is so with this new math curriculum, what year would, would that show in the testing? Would that be this year then? Next year or this coming school year? What? So if you think if, if, if freshmen had taken it last year, okay. there'll be sophomores this, this year, they'll okay. have taken geometry. Next school year, there'll be juniors, they'll be exposed to this assessment here. Yeah, okay, that was my, because I was just gonna ask like, you know, obviously the, you know, ELE scores are, are, are decent, but the math scores kind of always seem to lag um, with, I feel like most of the tests that the state provides. Um, and yeah, and it would be nice to have comparison data to kind of see, because I mean, Dr. Martin, I don't disagree that, you know, sometimes for some students, it is like that progression, you know, just even just advancing. But unfortunately, that doesn't translate, you know, in state testing numbers, you know, like, um, and so, uh, so that's kind of where more like a holistic view of, of things might kind of come more into play in the future. Because you're right, like, you know, some students are going to take baby steps throughout the year and then some are going to take giant leaps. But um, uh, at state testing, it's very kind of cut and dry. And then my next question is like for the students who are, are not graduation ready currently, like they're able to work with their advisor to, to choose the path to get them there. Um, I, I believe that decision is being made at the high school levels, um, but we will provide them with all three opportunities. That's what we are required to provide them with. So we've identified those students who fall into either or or both of those categories, and we will provide them with the opportunity based upon all three items. Because I would actually find that data interesting. Like how many of the students that don't fall into graduation ready, how many are just math, how many are just ELA, and how many are both? I think that would be important for me. I mean, it would just be interesting to see. I'm looking at my counterpart, Nora, who is the data guru. So um, we will be able to pro provide you with that exact information at a future date. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Team of three, I believe it is. <laughs> we said two, but really it's three, I think. So <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. And now we go on to administrative reports. Looks like we don't have any tonight. Is that right, Dr. Morton? Okay. So now we go to correspondence. Do any board members have any correspondence they'd like to share? Even though it's a summer. <laughs> this is winter. Yesterday, I was fortunate to be able to welcome the administrators at their administrative retreat, which occurred here at Carusi. Um, just a moment to say thank you to them from the board for all the work that they do throughout the year. It was a really nice opportunity to connect with the administrators from all the levels, preschool all the way through high school, and see their faces. And they seemed really energized and excited about the new school year. I personally love that September energy of the first day. And I think that was the vibe in the room. So I just wanted to say that it was a great opportunity to talk with them and we're getting really psyched for September to come. Okay, thank you. Thanks for doing that, Mrs. Winter, stepping in on behalf of multiples of us who were at college drop-off. You all have kids going to college and I'm like quite year that. So, you know, a few years will be my turn. Yeah, I uh, was trying to figure out how I was gonna do that from several hundred miles away. So thank you. Um, okay, other correspondence? Just wanted to uh, mention, so last uh, Monday evening, uh, Dr. Morton and I um, got a chance to um, have the first um, official uh, township level. Congratulations to our um, Chair Hill and a uh, team at the town council meeting. So that was that was a pretty nice event. Uh, big, big, uh, the, the students were, um, recognize and um, uh, officially, uh, I, I, I'm escaping what it's officially called a town council when they received a plaque and 
just a great recognition. So um, that was that was a really nice evening. It's just really nice to celebrate, to come together, to celebrate students from all over town, even though it's not an official school team. Um, it's, you know, it's the kids who go to these schools. So it's really cool. But uh, it's my only, I think that's my only correspondence. So. Okay. All right. Uh, we will now um, move on to, I don't know if we have uh, student rep reports tonight. Do we have student rep reports? We just have student reps attending. So thank, nice to have you. Welcome back from vacation. Uh, okay, so uh, we will move on to our first public comment. Um, we still at the moment have two public comment opportunities. The first one is for um, board action items only. And uh, there will be another public comment section for any uh, school related topic at the end of the meeting. If you are a student in the district, you may comment on any item at any time during the first public comment period. Uh, if you would like to speak and you're a student in the district, you will, we will always have students go first and you can either approach the stadium, uh, the stadium, the podium, if you're in the room, uh, or if you are online and you're a student, please raise your hand online and put an S next to your name. If you'd like to speak, um, public comment is an opportunity to, for members of the community to comment on matters relevant to operations of Cherry Hill Public School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on relevant matters. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech in public forums, statements which demean individual community members or groups or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or repetitive will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent, board president, and all board members via email or other alternative means. So if you are speaking and you are uh, not a student, but, uh, but you're speaking during first public comment, you please identify the agenda item and, um, and for everybody to please state your name and municipality. And um, we will start in the room. So there may be a student who wants to speak in the room. So if that's the case, uh, kindly approach the podium. Okay, if you please say your name and your municipality, which would be Cherry Hill. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeremy Radin. I'm obviously from Cherry Hill. Um, I'm the current co-president of East Musicians on Call at Cherry Hill East. Uh, unfortunately, Christian, our club's founder, is unable to attend tonight's meeting uh, as it is his first day at Harvard. Uh, anyway, on behalf of EMC, I would like to thank the Cherry Hill Board of Education for accepting our donation. Uh, over the past three years, EMC has provided an outlet for Cherry Hill students to showcase their talents, uh, but also form lifelong friendships over their shared joy of music. We hope that these funds can help make musical studies more accessible uh, to elementary school students in Cherry Hill by lowering the cost of uh, instrument rentals so that they too can have the same life-changing experiences. Thank you. Um, I was told for Dr. Morton. So let me thank you so much. We are so excited. We're going to be approving this on our agenda tonight, the official acceptance. Um, so thank you so much. We're so grateful, um, you know, for all of you and, and the other uh, East musicians on call who put time and energy outside of everything else that you guys do to raise money and to help the future students um, in Terry Hill. So I normally don't make comments of public comment, but I did want to just thank you so much. And yes, please feel free to hand that to Dr. Morton. And later on, we'll be able to um, to uh, to officially approve and accept the donation. So thank you so much. Okay, and then a little bit unusual, a little bit off the cuff, but all right. Um, if there are any other, we have now have a hand up online and um, if you please state your name and municipality and it's a phone number that ends in 891. My name is Jeff Potowitz. Uh, I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I wasn't I'm sorry, we see the phone. phone moving, but we cannot hear you. My name is Jeff Potterworth. I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Recognized. Potterworth, could you please hold on because we can only faintly hear you. We will try to fix that and then restart the clock. I'm sorry if you could just hold on while I try to sort that out. If not, see if it's on our end. Okay, thank you for being patient. If you would just kindly hold on, we're still trying to fix this.
Okay, Dr. Podowitz, if you could please check, try again. I think we've got you fixed, the, the, the volume fixed. Okay, my name is Jeff Podowitz. Do you hear me? I live in Cherry Hill, New yep. Jersey. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, no, you hear me? Okay, good. Um, strategic planning 18.1, 2023, 2024, approval of district goals. Please vote no or table this um, for further discussion. Revision why. One example, we had SAC. It has been very successful for many, many years. See page eight, um, number four. Review and assess recruitment processes and staffing process for the school age child care program. SAC, conduct thorough research, identify opportunities for improvement, and explore additional avenues for enhancement. To me, this is a change for change sake. Why change something that has been really, really successful? Um, for years with a probability of actually possibly breaking it but it was so it was so good it was great then number five provide a comprehensive and inclusive early childhood education program that supplies holistic development of young learners a uh, indices of success implement full day preschool uh, submission of application for preschool expansion aid develop and implement a survey for k for k teachers for kindergarten teachers measuring measuring preparedness for these students for kindergarten students in a document for the state of new jersey entitled new jersey strategic plan for expansion phase one the foundation on page 23 that's the very end of that document it states a goal of the state is to develop strategies to support infant and toddler care care likely benefits providing a safeguard for infant and toddler care to ensure that working families still have access to affordable care for young children concerned additional funding will be needed of course they are talking about additional state funding um, additional funding um, the state really wishes for additional funding uh, additional funding on the state doesn't doesn't want to pay for additional funding so a very large portion of that additional funding would come from our local property taxes, which is what the state desires. Dollars and ta local tax property dollars and rerouting of other dollars, other funds to infant, infant and child care. Why do I think that? Because just this would be just like what is happening with the extra state aid that's over six plus million dollars we received this year from the state. And local tax dollars also have been rerouted to for preschool expansion um, and also construction for preschool expansion, expansion be, be building classrooms, et cetera, and also with additional administrators and additional staff for preschool expansion. This being all is being done at the educational expense. Thank you, Dr. Padoas. I'm sorry your time has ended. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room for first public comment. You could state your name, your municipality, and the action item you're speaking about. Rick, uh, Rick Short, 18.2, goals, um, Cherry Hill. I also uh, would ask to table the uh, goals at this time. You're missing some things uh, under uh, hiring diverse workforce. I know it's been said by school board member that they want to see more uh, Hispanic uh, administrators. I know for a fact that um, once a uh, board member said that they uh, thought there were too many uh, white students at Russell Knight. Um, so I think what's happening here with the uh, claim of uh, diverse, uh, the last few hires have all been African American. So you're leaving out Asian administrators, you're leaving out Hispanic uh leadership and you're also uh leaving out white so i would suggest you just remove that entire subject because it's just it's silly because we can't keep track of it all of how many of this and how many of that because there's no perfect combination just hire by merit also moving on to people that are being brought in to um there's one section about brain, I think uh, it's called brain wellness. It's one of the um, uh, consultants you're bringing in. I believe it's uh, Julia, uh, so I can't even say her last name. She's from uh, the uh, Franklin Institute. She's originally from the Franklin Institute. 
But if you look at any of the data that she's been working with, and she's also been worth working with Cherry Hill East, I do knew that, um, there's been no increase in uh, grades or no increase in um, academic success with this consultant. So why are we using a consultant that doesn't bring us any academic success? Uh, moving on to the uh, final thing. Um, let's see up here. Your mission statement at the top doesn't make any sense. One, se one section you're saying, uh, these are our statements of belief for student wellness. And then you go into uh, like solutions under like uh, climate I'm change. I'm sorry, this is not, it's not an action item agenda. Just stay on topic, please, to the action items. Well, isn't it in the, isn't it under, under the goals? I could have sworn I saw it under the goals student wellness, and then it goes into indicators of success. Yeah, the indicators is, on, is well, part of our what we're approving tonight, yes. Right, so full implementation of climate improvement program. How does that have anything to do with thank, cultural response? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Short. Thank you. Okay, um, and we go back to the line, and Carolina Bevitt, if you could please state your name, your municipality, and your action item you're speaking on tonight. Hi, Carolina Bevid, Cherry Hill. I'm also speaking on 18.1. I agree with the two previous commenters. I don't think the board goal should be approved tonight. As I read through, I don't see a lot of measurability, things that can be measured or ways to measure them. And when I do see things that are marked as measured, measurable, it's at 100%. Um, for example, 100% of third graders will be able to read at grade level. That doesn't even seem realistic. Um, so I think that the goals need to be looked at again and maybe a bit more focused and maybe also a bit more focused on academics. There's a lot of wellness stuff, which is important, but we are a school, as I've mentioned before, not a mental health facility. So we do need to focus on academics and measurable goals. So for example, like when Dr. Morton was talking about reading levels, you know, students will improve, you know, elementary students will improve three reading levels from where they started. That's measurable. Not 100% of students will be able to read on on level. Like, that's great. Admirable would be wonderful, but probably not realistic. So I would urge a no vote on these. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. First public comment, if there's anyone who'd like to speak on any action items. Uh, Dr. Yoni Yaris, uh, also on goals. I don't remember the agenda item, so I apologize. Um, Can you just say your municipality? Cherry Hill. Sorry. I should have known that. Um, just wanted to add that a new language has come from my district. It's an asset based approach. Um, should be taken. A lot of stuff seems to be targeted in a deficit approach. I'm also could be exhausted from several days of PD, um, but working on it and using a language where we're talking about what students bring to the classroom versus talking about what students don't have right now. So then we're talking about it's a positive based approach so the students feel honored and heard. I do appreciate all the SDL in there. While we are not a mental institution, mental institution place of practice, students are whole students. We can't just treat them as a, oh, you're just here to learn because we've seen it. It doesn't work that way. We're whole people. We're all components and that by seeking a whole student approach, they are more likely to be successful. I do sincerely appreciate the commitment to finding a staff that represents our students. Study after study after study has shown when students are taught by people who look like them, they are more successful. And other students who are not like that staff member are able to bring in new experiences. I sat around a table today where several of us spoke about our experience in K-12 education and what was missed because we knew absolutely nothing about Black history beyond the big three, which would be your Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, et cetera. Whereas we didn't get into what it actually meant to be in the whole experience, and we're all being educators. So I think this is really important about building an inclusive education that understands where there were flaws and builds upon it so that we are making it better and that we're not resting on it. Our education was perfect. I can tell you, my education wasn't perfect. So I want to make sure that my children's education is one step closer to perfection. Thank you. Okay. Don't see any other hands online. Go back to the room.
Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill, 14.4. Um, when you readapt the curriculum tonight, um, there are items in the curriculum that are taught that require um, parent or guardian presence. Um, I had that case this past year, and it was scheduled at a time that I was still working because it's for elementary school students, and it started at 530, and SAC ends at 6. So if we could please be mindful to tell our schools that they need to schedule after work hours, after SAC, when childcare is over, so that students don't lose out on curriculum that's being offered by the district because their parents are working and a parent is required to be there. Thank you. No other hands online. Anybody else in the room? Okay, I'm going to close first public comment, and uh, we will go to acting superintendent's comments. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Stern. I'd like to take an opportunity as I begin my comments to again share the list of uh, school board candidates uh, that we received. Um, if you are in the room, I'd ask that you stand. If you are online, I'll ask that you raise your hand. I will start with John M. Brangan, Renee Scherfain, Corinne Elmore Stratton, Kimberly Gallagher, Nicholas Gaudio Jr., Jennifer Sharman, and Miriam Stern. Thank you all. I'd also like to share that uh, on October 1st, there will be a candidates forum. The candidates forum will start at promptly at 7 p.m. It will be live streamed for the, uh, for the community to see. So there's tremendous positivity in the air. Uh, in just 14 days, our students will return. Um, we, we ask ourselves uh, consistently, where's the summer gone? Uh, but it's always exciting. Uh, to have the return of students. Uh, over the last two days, our administrators have been together for admin retreat. As Ms. Winters mentioned, um, she was here to, to, to greet our administrators and there was tremendous excitement as well. Uh, administra administrative team is looking forward to the opportunity to engage and collaborate and partner uh, with the school, with their school communities um, and partner and work with their children. Uh, we're moving forward under the mantra of unity, and optimism. It's just something that's extremely important for us and important themes uh, in moving into this year. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, and recognize an individual who, um, who I'm very fond of and you know very appreciative to have known um, since coming to Cherry Hill, a gentleman who recently passed away by the name of Mr. Bill McCargo. Um, I can recall coming to Cherry Hill in 2008 and uh, meeting Bill and Pat, a tandem. Um, I, I recall meeting them and sitting and having a conversation. And I just remember the level of um, affection that I felt and the warmth that you know was on his face and, and within his eyes and, and that smile, you know, the uncanny smile that that Bill um, that Bill possessed. Over the years, um, the, the, the relationship obviously furthered and grew further and developed and um, the fruition of many things that we see throughout the district now as it relates to um, the acceptance of people, the inclusion of all people have come from the work that Bill and Pat envisioned uh, for Cherry Hill. Uh, I'm a manifestation of that work as well. So, so for me, there's a personal level of gratitude uh, for him and for you know what he's meant. I had an opportunity to see him uh, last at the Juneteenth parade. So I recall coming down the end of the of the parade route, saw Pat. She said, "Bill's here." I walked over, had a chance to see Bill, and I'll never forget the look in his eyes this time when I saw him. He was in, he was he was seated. He wasn't mobile at the time, but the look in his eyes was one of of satisfaction and contentment to say that you know look at what my work has, has been able to create. That's at least what I felt um, when I looked in his eyes the last time. But nonetheless, uh, definitely want to say farewell to Bill McCargo and recognize him for his, his outstanding efforts. 
Thank you, Dr. Morton. Uh, and I think uh, Bill and Pat McCargo were significant contributors directly to our Board of Education and our public schools. So um, strong advocates. It's the first time I ever met them with through uh, their presence in our school board meeting. So and I'm a newbie to Cherry Hill relatively compared to many people like the McCargos who are now, I guess, third generation here. So definitely will be missed a great loss for our, our, our township and our, our community. All right. Sad note, but we, we continue on. Um, so we will now move to our action item or action agenda. I'm sorry. Um, and we will start with um, our uh, appointments. All right. I just want to get back to the screen. Um, and I'm going to um, uh, kick this to, to, to Mrs. Fleischer. Sorry. <laughs> we're okay. a couple of people who are on There's vacation or dropping their kids at college. So we're right. a little, we're moving things around a bit tonight. Happy to help out Miss uh, Elmore Stratton since she's not here tonight. Um, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following appointments, 13.1 substance abuse coordinator, 13.2 homeless liaison, 13.3 district anti-bullying coordinator. Do I have a second? Dr. Rood, any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, can you open up the voting, please? Okay, the voting is open. Board members, you may cast your votes. We have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, great. And we will move on to curriculum and instruction. Mrs. Winters, can you please move the CNI agenda? Sure. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following, 14.1, approval of attendance at conference and workshops for the 23-24 school year. 14.2, approval of out-of-district student placement for 23-24 school year. 14.3, approval of services contract with NJ Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired for the 23-24 school year. 14.4, approval of readopting curriculum. 14.5, resolutions approving professional development. 14.6, resolution approving a professional services agreement between the Cherry Hill Board of Education and the Cooper Health System to provide services at Pulitz Day School. 14.7, resolution approving a professional services agreement between the Cherry Hill Board of Education and Catapult Learning LLC to provide services at Pulitz Day School. And 14.8, resolution approving a professional services agreement between the Cherry Hill Board of Education and Catapult Learning LLC to provide services at Pulitz Day School. Do I have a second? Ms. Fleischer, are there any questions? Ms. Sugars, please open the voting. Okay, the voting is open. You may cast your votes. We have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, I'm going to move the business and facilities agenda. As Mr. Mayor is probably driving as we speak, maybe he's arrived at his destination. Um, so 15.1 uh, approval of minutes um, for our July 11th, 2023 meeting. 15.2 uh, 15 approval of minutes for, I'm sorry, the 15.1 was for our special action meeting minutes and executive session minutes for July 11th. 15.2 was approval of minutes for our regular meeting minutes and executive session minutes dated July 25th. 15.3 financial reports. Uh, 15.4 resolutions, 15.5 resolutions for the RFPs, award of RFPs, 15.6 uh, resolution for the award of transportation, and 15.7 acceptance of donations, which are the West um, uh, Theater Boosters monetary donation to be used for the spring musical, and the East Musicians on Call monetary uh, donation to be used for musical instruments for elementary schools. Do I have a second? Dr. Rood, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, can you call the vote, please? Mrs. Sugars, I need to abstain from 15.3, please.
Okay, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, and um, now we will go um, back to uh, human resources. Uh, I'm, the, yeah, the appointments, and I, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little off my game with that. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Fleischer. I'm going to send this to Mrs. Fleischer for the HR agenda, the HR itself agenda. <laughs> of course, I'm happy again to step in for Mrs. Elmer Stratton while she's out. Um, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following: sixteen point one termination of employment certificated, sixteen point two termination of employment non certificated, sixteen point three appointments certificated. 16.4 appointments non-certificated, 16.5 assignment salary change certificated, 16.6 assignment salary change non-certificated, 16.7 leaves of absence certificated, 16.8 leaves of absence non-certificated, 16.9 other compensation certificated, 16.10 other compensation non-certificated, and 16.11 Approval of new job description, and that is the district music coordinator and the lead principal secondary. Do I have a second? Mrs. Stern, um, any questions? Seeing none. Oh, you do, Mrs. Winters. I'm not sure if I can answer it, but go right ahead. <laughs> it's less a question than just sort of a follow through from our work on CNI that Ms. Christy Blandetto is on the agenda tonight. She is going to be the new curriculum supervisor for 6 through 12 math and science. This was something that was brought to the board from the CNI committee, and we're really excited to have that position filled. I also, because I was not here last time, just wanted to say how thrilled I am to have a district music coordinator position. Um, I think Music and the arts is just key to who we are in Cherry Hill. It was formative for me as a student. Um, my high school music experience was framed by music as the reason that I went to school. It was just foundational for me. And I'm really thrilled that we'll have somebody serving in that position to really give cohesiveness to our music curriculum from pre-K all the way through 12. Thank you, Mrs. Winters. I think we all agree. Very excited about the um, that new uh, position. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, can you open up the voting, please? The board members, uh, voting is open. You may cast your votes. And we have a unanimous yes vote. Dr. Morton. Absolutely. I just want to take an opportunity um, to, to introduce everyone to Christy Blundetto. Christy Blundetto is actually here with us this evening, our new uh, CNI supervisor uh, at the secondary level for mathematics and science. I'm so excited to have Christy join the district. Uh, we interviewed her back in the spring. I feel like back in the spring, and we, we had to wait just a little bit, work through some, some issues. But as I told her when we spoke, I knew 20 minutes into that interview that she was the person and she was, she was definitely worth the wait. Uh, Christy comes to us um, as a science department coordinator, um, Haddon Heights School District. Uh, she has a tremendous background and a diverse background in teaching science to the, the widest array of children, children at all levels um, here in New Jersey and in Texas as well. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in biology from Philadelphia University master's in education with a concentration in curriculum and instruction from Central Michigan University. She has administrative certification from Drexel University. And I'm gonna provide you with a fun fact as she walks up. She comes up and shares a few comments with us as well. I said, Christy, Cherry Hill is, can be an intense place at times. Do you think you can handle the intensity? She said, Dr. Morton, I'm a former zoologist. I've been exposed to life and death situations. I absolutely can handle it. With that, I introduce Christy. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Morton. Uh, thank you, board. Uh, I'm so excited to be joining Cherry Hill and uh, given the opportunity to serve the students in the community. And uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty unflappable. Hopefully that stays that way. Um, calm under pressure. And I'm just so looking forward to getting started. And thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you. Oh, welcome to Cherry Hill.
All right. Uh, Mrs. Fleischer, again, for the and, win. And I'm back. And I'll be back one more time. So I'm sorry. I will apologize to everybody. Or if you could please right. uh, move the p &L agenda. Of course. Um, the superintendent, superintendent recommends, and I approve the following. 17.1, first reading of policies, P2270, religion and schools, P5310, health services, P5520, immunization, P7440, school district security. 17.2, the second reading of policy, we have one, it's P2419, school threat assessment teams. 17.3, approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, hearing decision. 17.4, approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, hearing decision. Do I have a second? Um, I was like, Mrs. Gallagher, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and I have to do the presentation next. I have to like get back with it. Um, do I, <laughs> are there any questions? I'm seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, can you um, bring up the vote? Board members, you may cast your votes. Just to confirm, Mrs. Sugars, 17.3 and 17.4 were from the last meeting, which was August 8th. Is that correct? Well, I wasn't here. I just want to make sure that I need to abstain from those. They were from, okay, so I need to abstain from 17.3 and 17.4. I would right. also need to abstain yeah. from 17.3 and 17.4 for the same reason. I was not present at the August 8th meeting. Uh, Mr. Sugars, I have um, a note to myself to, um, so I, I voted yes overall, but I want to on um, I'm not sure which number it is, but it's the 249847HIB um, to vote no. Um, uh, Mr. Sugar, 17.4, um, I also vote no. Everything else is yes, 847. Thank you. Yeah, that was 17.4 for me as well. Yeah, other than the exceptions noted, we have a unanimous yes. Okay, and now we move on to strategic planning. And um, Dr. Rood, you have, if you would kindly move the strategic planning agenda tonight. Okay, so uh, in strategic planning, um, our, we're going to be uh, voting on the district goals, but before I move the agenda, I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, Mrs. Fleischer, who's going to take us, uh, or at least get started for us, a presentation on those district goals. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rood. Um, tonight, I'm very excited to present a, it's a brief overview of the district goals. Um, the district goals are always posted on our website. They're actually embedded in the agenda also for everyone to see. Uh, we'll be doing a short presentation, sort of an overview, because there's a lot of different things that we've done this year. Um, so the first thing I wanted to um, say is I am really happy with the way that we created the goals. The goals are a yearly um, item that we have to update. And um, when we looked at it this year, we really wanted to try to be more collaborative with the administration um, and including um, all, you know, all different uh, ideas and different input from uh, the different stakeholders that we have. And I think we've done a great job to come out with something that I think for us is new. I think it's something that we definitely need to work towards. A lot of these are not the goals that we're going to do in the first year. I think some of these are multi-year goals, which always happens with goals because you always want to be, you know, some are going to be ones that we can do right away and some are multi-year. Um, but you'll see the difference if you can compare from last year to this year, there was more of a graph and a rubric, which is posted right now on our website. Um, I think this actually is more user-friendly. Um, I think it sort of flows a little, a little bit better. And just for people to know, just overall, when we talk about our mission statement and 
I'm just going to just say this overall because of some of the questions that came up. The mission statement, our belief statements, and actually um, our actual goals, those remain unchanged. The, those have been our goals for the last, I don't even know how many years now, like six, five or six years. So those are consistent. It's sort of what we're bringing in is supporting mechanisms to those goals. So those, the three goals, which we'll talk about later, um, have been our goals for a while. But the next thing I wanted to just say is a huge thank you. Um, the way that we created these goals was through a committee structure. And um, the members of the committee is Mrs. Winters, um, Mr. Mayor, and Mrs. Elmer Stratton, and myself. Um, so we tried to work with our committees. Um, we tried to work with um, the board members. And we also had a huge, huge help from all the assistant principals. I mean, I'm sorry, the assistant superintendents. Um, Mrs. Webbington, Dr. Mahan, Ms. Mallory, all of you were such a great help and really translating things that we, you are the experts. So you're helping us sort of create these goals to make sure our kids really are successful. Um, and I want to put a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Morton. He really was the one who took this to the next level. He's the one that helped us create a different type of document. And I'm really excited to um, be able to talk about that tonight. So I'm going to hand it actually over to Dr. Morton because Mrs. Winters, um, Dr. Morton and I will be sort of tag teaming to do this. And uh, so the first uh, slide will go to Dr. Morton. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ms. Fleischer. Uh, and absolutely, it was it was definitely a collaborative process, one um, that the administrative team uh, appreciated greatly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that that is a theme for us and moving forward in the district, you know, this idea of unity, collaboration and partnership. Um, so the idea behind the, the the framing of this document was to provide some type of co coherence and a cohesive way for us um, to understand what it is that we believe, um, why we exist as a school district what we say we're going to do on a daily basis, and then how that translates into the goals that we had already had established as part of our strategic um, planning process. And then how do we lay that out in terms of tangible actions, um, indicators of major activities, indicators of success, and then milestones of achievement. Uh, our well, we'll, we'll get into this throughout the presentation, but everything works together and it points toward um, this apex of the milestones of achievement. In other words, the, the bottom line, what did it, what our ultimate goal is and what we're trying to accomplish and have happen for each and every one of our students. Thank you, Dr. Morton. So the next slide is about our mission statement. And again, this is something that has been our mission statement for our district for many years. Um, but this is different because it's never been actually in our goals document. And I think Dr. Morton had brought it up, which we as a committee thought was wonderful to put this in the next slide, which we'll get to in a second, the beliefs um, together, because it, sh it shows the core beliefs of our district connected with our goals. So it's really all together in one document. So I'm going to read our mission statement because it really conveys exactly why we exist as a district. We shall provide all children with an education that develops open-minded thinkers, with the strong academic and interpersonal skills to thrive in an ever-changing world and make it a better place for all. Then the next slide is our belief statement. And when you're seeing our goals, these are the first, um, this is the actual first page of our goals is, are these two slides. Our belief statement conveys our values, hopes, and bottom line convictions. Examples are all students need positive relationships with faculty and staff members, all learning must occur in safe and secure environments. All staff will dedicate themselves to supporting student achievement. A variety of instructional modalities and technical tools must be used to accomplish student learning. And then that takes us to our learner-centered experiences. And learner-centered experiences convey the manner that we shall facilitate learning in classrooms across the district. So uh, regardless of what school one may arrive at, in, in, in our district, this is how we believe that learning should take place. These are things that we believe should be evident in every classroom across the board, appropriate to level, of course, um, uh, and adaptable to level. 
Uh, but some examples, we'll customize learning to meet each student's unique needs. That was one of the questions that we had received, you know, following our, our, our um, NJGPA report. We'll use ongoing assessments to track achievement and growth, adjust curriculum delivery, and fill any learning gaps. Students will showcase their learning through creative content creation and various modes of demonstrating what they have learned. We'll provide targeted interventions in a multi-tiered system of supports based on research to address student needs. There are more learning-centered experiences in the actual document, but this is just an ex example of a few. So what we're all working towards, the apex of that graphic you saw early on in the presentation is these major milestones of achievement. And what I wanna say about this is that when I became the chair of curriculum and instruction in January, the first thing the committee did and that committee is myself, Ms. Stern, Ms. Elmore Stratton and Dr. Rood is we met with our administrative liaisons, which is Dr. Morton, Dr. Mahan and Ms. Mallory to talk about how we would conceptualize what achievement looks like for Cherry Hill. Because I think one of the struggles we've had in the past is that we've been struggling to define what and articulate exactly what we're going for, what our goals are, what we're reaching for with achievement. And Dr. Morton had a vision and it was a vision beginning with where do we end? We end with high school seniors. What do we expect our kids to be able to do when they're graduating from Cherry Hill Public Schools? So he began with the first one. High school seniors will graduate on time and be prepared for post-secondary success in college the military or the workforce. After that, he worked backwards with the committee to talk about what benchmarks, what checkpoints we would need to look at as children progress through their academic years in Cherry Hill to make sure that they reach that final milestone, the goal that we're all hoping for, which is kids graduate successful out of Cherry Hill for whatever their next step might be. So the, prior to graduating, 10th grade is a significant moment where we need to know that kids will be on track to graduate on time. Because if by 10th grade, they're not on that right path, we need to definitely adjust things so that they're ready to meet those 12th grade requirements. Prior to 10th grade, you look at eighth grade. And we're, because eighth grade is that moment right before entering high school where they have to be prepared to access the high school curriculum. And here we have an emphasis on math readiness. And you saw with the NJGPA testing, we've seen it with NJSLA. This is a, this is a, piece that we've been focusing on. This is why we split the CNI supervision into two pieces. This is why we've been talking about math coaches, all of these things that we're providing supports for. This is the goal we're reaching towards to have the eighth grade students prepared to access the high school math curriculum. Prior to that, the next significant checkpoint is reading at grade level or above by the end of third grade. Again, kids who are, the beginning of elementary school is when you're learning to read. Once you get to third, fourth grade, you're talking about reading to learn. So they have to be able to read and access the curriculum fluently by that point. Now, this is not something that we're gonna achieve tomorrow. On September 5th, I don't expect that every single kid in Cherry Hill is gonna be able to read at or above grade level by the end of third grade. That's why it's a goal. That's what we're working towards. This is what we're hoping for. And if we fall short, this is when we reassess and put additional supports in place. Our excellent administrators, staff, Faculty, they know how to do that. They know what those things are. And my concept, my concept of the board of the CNI committee in particular is that we are gonna to continue to work with them collaboratively to put those supports in place so that we can reach closer and closer to these milestones for our kids. And then finally, the very beginning, right? Every student entering kindergarten and learning to read fluently by the end of first grade. And I think we've seen a huge focus on early childhood from this board and from the CNI committee, understanding that the jump to full day K was huge for our kids. In September, we're gonna, I'm just gonna give you a little preview. We're gonna have some data coming out about the full day kindergarten curriculum and how successful that curriculum has been for our kids. And also looking backwards from kindergarten, articulating back to we're moving from half day to full day preschool this fall. That's happening in just a few weeks. And I really think that the enhancements to the full day pre-K curriculum that our kids are going to be able to access is going to help to reach those goals of reading where they need to be by the end of first grade to move forward. So that's sort of the overall concept that Dr. Morton was able to bring to the committee to help us understand because board members, we are, we are laymen. We are not experts. We needed help to understand what the vision was. And the vision I feel like is really exciting for us going forward. And it's going to help us motivate us for all that we do to help support education in Cherry Hill. 
So the next slide here are the bedrocks of what we believe and what went into this plan. So the first piece is this academic achievement piece, which I discussed on the previous slide. But in tandem and equally as important are the next two pieces, social emotional learning and student and staff wellness. And I just wanna to pause to talk about these for a minute because I really feel like in this moment, as we continue to recover from the trauma of the pandemic, we need to realize that our kids are struggling. And our staff is, is trying their best to help them, but our staff is also struggling. We all have impacts from what happened during the pandemic. And I think, you know, we've seen that if kids are bringing to school unexpected behaviors that we are struggling to deal with, if they are unable to have positive conflict resolution, peer relationships, all these pieces, it's gonna be so much harder for them to access the academic portion of the curriculum. And we see that over and over again, that's a piece that's been brought to us by parents in these board meetings, a piece that's been brought to us by our teachers and we listen. We listen to what they're telling us and that was why we decided to have these bedrocks embedded into our goals this year. I just wanna take a moment to especially emphasize the staff wellness piece because our staff, our people, are the greatest asset that we have in this district. They work with our children each and every day to help those kids be successful. We need to make sure that they feel supported as well because the lift that they have is so heavy and heavier now. As Like I said, they deal with all of these impacts and all of these changes that have gone on. And at, you know, as the kids are exhibiting new behaviors, we're seeing things that maybe existed in the past, but are at a different level now, it's our staff that are on the front lines to deal with that. So we have to, as a board, I feel like, and as a district, as administration, equally support them so that we can all be successful in moving forward together. And the last piece I just wanna to touch on, equally important, is equity and inclusivity. It is my feeling that this district needs to be a place where all students, staff, and faculty, and administration feel safe, secure, and supported. We need schools that every single person who walks into them can feel like they are welcomed and at home there. We need a school climate that is positive and that every single person who's a member of our school community, no matter who they are, from preschooler all the way to a high school teacher, whoever they are in our district, that they feel that they are part of our team because it's all of us in it together. It's every single one of those 11,000 students. It's every single one of our staff, our faculty, all of us together. We are stronger for our diversity, but it also brings challenges when you talk about how do we make sure everybody's lens is what we're looking through? How do we make sure everybody feels welcomed? How do we make sure everyone feels safe and supported and is ready to learn? Because if you don't have that positive school climate, then how can we possibly have all of these other pieces in place? So that's why we talked about those four pieces infused into these goals to make them successful going forward. Thank you. The next slide is district goals. And as I said um, previously, these district goals are not new. These are ones that we have had for at least five years. So when we're looking at creating the goals, this sort of creates our framework. And then we have um, what Dr. Morton will talk about um, afterwards is what we have actions, major activities, and in, um, indicators of success. So I'm going to talk about, I'll do a brief um, explanation of what our goals are. And then Dr. Morton afterwards will give an example. Um, as we said at the beginning, this is going to be an overall view and the entire um, board goals are embedded into the agenda. So our first district goal is student wellness. Create frameworks of learning and support for all students to develop skills needed for social and emotional wellness. And I'm just gonna go with the um, main um, things. Goal two, purpose and passion. Develop highly engaged learner-centered experiences within environment that promotes voice, choice, and passion for learning. Goal number three, connecting beyond our classrooms. Provide resources, opportunities, and experiences for our students to connect to the world beyond their classrooms and to become more informed and empathetic agents of change in the world. So within each of the goals, um, to help to accomplish those goals and to actualize the goals, there are actions, major activities, and indicators of success that are embedded. Uh, it's just, this is just an example of one. So under purpose and passion, the action that we state will, that will occur 
Establish an environment at every school where every student feels safe, welcome, and respected and has access to academic support and benefits from an inclusive, academically focused culture. Major activities. This is what we expect will occur. I'm not going to read all of them, but I'll just, I'll just sample a few. Uh, utilize multiple formative assessment data to improve student achievement. Focus on differentiate, differentiated instruction to close achievement gaps. Establish staff professional development for continued growth. It's an example of major activities. And then we have indicators of success. Uh, math co coach support, use of guided observations, school-based SMART goals aligned to achievement with actionable steps toward attainment, specific emphasis on mathematics and ELA and subgroup performance. There are many more that are embedded um, within these indicators of success and within our goals document as well. But here's, here's how it works. So as a, as a board, as a district, we established the overarching expectation. Um, our schools are at different places. Our children are at different places. Their data varies. Um, we, we saw that uh, earlier today um, in the achievement presentation. What the schools will do is that the administrative teams at each building will extend upon each one of these goals by developing um, building-based goals attainment action plans. So what they'll list is in a SMART goal framework, they'll list the strategies and next steps that will be implemented along with evidences of effectiveness to be able to determine um, when and if these goals get accomplished. Uh, myself, Dr. Mahan, members of the administrative team will work with, with the buildings uh, throughout the course of the year uh, to monitor progress and, and to monitor growth ongoing. We will take those building-based goals attainment action plans. We're gonna share them. We're gonna share them with the board and we're gonna share them with the community. This is what we're all about. This is what we're striving for. Um, so, you know, we have confidence that this is what it is. Hold us accountable for these, these results as we push forward and as we move forward. I, I think the spirit of uh, the goals here um, have definitely been this collaborative process. We've tried to incorporate the feedback that's that's been heard uh, it's been uh, a back and forth process to see if we can come up with a tangible document that will move us forward. When we talk about the milestones of achievement, understand that they are uh, reflective of the, the, the masses of, of research that exists around learning um, and successful outcomes for children. We mentioned third grade, being able to read on, on grade level by the end of third grade. Well, the data says if a child is not on grade level by the end of grade three, the likelihood of that child catching up by the time they get to 12th grade is slim. So that's a, that's a key indicator for us, a key checkpoint. Um, one of the, the, the things that we went back and forth with about was um, the understanding of kids with mathematics and algebraic concepts. The bottom line, is, if a child does not fully understand and have a good grasp on algebraic concepts, they cannot ascend to higher levels of mathematics and it negatively impacts the ability to, to, to comprehend mathematics as they move forward throughout their high school careers and, and beyond that. So those are things that we included as milestones for us. Um, much thought, much collaboration, uh, much discussion, much conversation. I'm proud of, of, of the document that's been developed. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Um, the last thing I will say is how does the board use the goals, our board? So the way that the board um, Dr. Morton explained how he is going to translate it with the administration, with the principals in the in the buildings. So our what we've always done and which we will continue to do is our board looks at our goals, then brings it back to committee. We decide which committees will oversee some of these goals, and then we map it out for the year. And that's what we try to do so that we make sure that we're always consistently working on one or more of the goals uh, throughout the year for our kids um, and to make sure that we're getting through these. Um, and we use this goals as like a guidepost for us for all the committees. Um, so I think I am very proud of it too. I think it's probably been our biggest collaboration to date. Um, for many years, and I appreciate everyone's openness and willingness to work together. Um, I know, as in every document, it's not perfect, right? And it's also multi-year, and we're going to have to go back and check things. And you know, it, it's 
always growing and it's, it's sort of a living document to be honest, because our school district is so dynamic. So um, I'm really looking forward to really starting the work on it when it gets passed. So I wanted to ask any of the board members, do you have questions? Mrs. Stern. Okay, so um, not a question, <laughs> Just a few comments. Um, uh, first, and I'll start with um, on the board side. So Mrs. Fleischer, I, I first really wanna thank you and the committee chairs who took that lead on this. Um, I was grateful to be on the outside this time, this year, because the past two years, I've been on the inside of goal, goal development. And it was, it was, um, a, I'm very much appreciative that I could be on the outside, but yet we were constantly included, you know, through the committee work, um, you know, over the last several months, sending out the board goals to the board members so we could review, so we could bring back with our questions, our comments, um, you know, in our Friday memo, Dr. Morton, you know, would include them. Um, it was, it was, you know, there was so much opportunity for input, um, even though I wasn't on the committee this year, um, that, um, you know, that was, it was, it was fantastic. So thank you. And again, to the chairs who were involved, um, you know, on the, on the smaller group work. Um, I also um, and want to thank um, Dr. Morton and your team. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, last year, Mrs. Fleischer, you said we need to have a different approach to goal development. It has to be much more collaborative. Um, and I think that you um, together at the helm, both of you brought your teams together and made this just so much more collaborative. So, you know, thank you both um, and to your teams. Um, you know, I think this, the importance of the goals is they have to be relevant. They have to be relevant. They have to be um, meaningful. And they do, we do need to be more, We you know, for the year. I mean, I've been on this board now as my third year on the board. You know, we talk about data, data, data driven. Well, here it is. It couldn't be more specific to be very clear, you know, third grade and the algebraic concepts in eighth grade. Um, and I thank you, Dr. Morton. We, we, we kind of had some conversations about where's the math? Where's the math? Well, there it is. Um, you know, is it perfect? Is it, is this everything that, you know, I think all of us wanted to see maybe not, but it's certainly, um, a huge step forward and a move in the right direction. And the last piece I want to say um, is, and Mrs. Winters, you touched on this, um, you know, anyone who tells you that SEL is about mental health doesn't necessarily understand what mental health is. That is my field. Um, SEL is not mental health. Mental health is one component of SEL, which is a much broader topic. SEL is about children understanding how to manage conflict on the playground so that when they come back in from recess, they know how to, they're ready to learn because they've had a good experience working through as a team. You know, it's about staff feeling comfortable working together. SEL is so much more. And in this day and age, if, if you think you can be in a work environment or a school environment and not recognize the importance of social interactions, the importance of soft skills, the importance of ensuring that people feel comfortable and safe in their environments so that they can do their work or learn in a school system that students can learn, you're, you're completely missing the best practices that are out there. I mean, we, you know, when we, we as a board face, you know, the, the, com, the, com, um, the topic on a regular basis of conflict and bullying and HIV, you know, SEL are the tools that children use and staff use to help tools, children work through those topics, you know, to try to mitigate those those challenges you 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 cannot have children ready to learn but they're not widgets they're they're little human beings and sometimes bigger human beings who are figuring out how to be in the world and in doing so how to develop their skills and grow and it's our it's our school's jobs to provide those environments so i i really i really have to say um you know this is 21st century learning. That's what SEL is about. Um, and it's best practice based. So I am very proud that these are in our goals and they continue to be a focus because they are the part of the foundation 
for our children being successful in their academics. So um, I had to just, I had to say that piece because it's critically important that this stays in our, in our goals and as a focus and the staff piece coming out of pandemic, if we, we talk about this all the time, the intersectionality of the work we do and the work the, the district does, we have a, a human resources department. We people want, we want to attract and retain the best staff we can. They have to come to a work environment that feels good to be in, where they feel supported. That's where, that's why people come to jobs and stay in jobs. It's one of the reasons. So let's make sure our work environments are recognizing the very important human resources that are part of this. So thank you for letting me say all that, Mrs. Fleischer. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Very Sarah. happy about where we're at with this. I appreciate it. More questions, Mrs. Gallagher? So I, um, so first and foremost, so if, if the goals are being pushed down to the individual buildings, um, will there be a push for like consistency or will it kind of be up to the, like to the buildings to decide like how they, like what they choose, how they're going to focus? I, I'm just curious how that process is. Well, I, I guess it's specific to the the goal that you are you're speaking of, but I guess there will be consistency in terms of approach and implementation and expectation. Uh, consistency in terms of the expectation that SEL supports will be in place to support children. Consistency in terms of um, the expectation around collaboration, partnership, unifying your community. Consistency in terms of implementation of some type of framework to support positive behavior in school and to help the climates improve. It, th that definitely will be consistency. Weird things like uh, divert just a, a bit, maybe well, consistency in terms of academic achievement and growth being made, but it depends what the starting point is. We're, we're looking for our, you know, across the board, everyone to make growth and every child to make growth. Um, but in terms of how that's quantified may, may vary just a bit. And um, how will that information be presented? Like, will it be public? Like, will like each... Um, school building website like have a dashboard in some way to show like the uh, the metrics where you are any type of supporting information so that's our hope that's what that's what we're working for so you'll see there's a goal built in 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 here in this document that we'll create an online dashboard um, the specific metrics that will be included and will be made available we'll need to discuss further um, as a board uh, but that is the intention. Um, myself and Mr. Levinsky had a conversation just just today. You know, we're, we're talking about you know just that and how to how to best make that happen for us and for the district. And then I guess finally, um, like once the buildings have had the chance to like look over the goals, decide you know however they want to discuss it. Obviously, there's budgetary constraints. Um, so I'm curious how the budget was considered in these goals. There are budgetary constraints, um, but there's opportunities as well, I believe, to, you know, to be creative and to, to better utilize the resources that exist within the schools in the most efficient manner possible. Um, we'll explore efficiency, I think, first and foremost, and then we'll begin to, you know, consider other budgetary items. You recall that the board did provide additional support, um, you know, to the school via math coaches and uh, things along those lines. So I think we're in a good place. I think we're in a, a good place. You'll see, you know, the intention is you'll see synergy and alignment with the district's goals and what the schools are actually working on. And when building principals come and, and share updates, you should see a direct correlation and alignment with what's been approved and established and what's happening inside of uh, buildings. So I guess, and actually what you just said is exactly where I'm having problems. You know, I would like to actually see that in goal, in approving the goals, because right now it just feels like these ideas and it's the tangibility of them and the implementation and the like, the, def the definition, you know, of, of how of the interpretation of the goals and how the schools are and how the district is going to um, 
get there, right? And so for me as a board member, I'm having trouble kind of seeing because, um, you know, I come from a business background. And so it's very much like, you know, percentages, metrics, KPIs, all that stuff. And so I read the goals and I'm like, well, these, of course, like, yes, right? <laughs> of course, I want every student to graduate. And of course, I want every child to, to read on level. Um, but I also know that like, just personal experience, I have a daughter in second grade, or she's going into third grade. So it's kind of timely with what this is. She is a year behind in reading. We have had to pay for tutors. She has the reading specialist every single day. And mm -hmm. so if you consider that on a grand scale, um, that's resource heavy, right? And so, um, you know, it's, it's, what I see is what I would like to see is, you know, obviously the goal is 100%, right? That's also probably not going to happen. Um, you know, obviously not tomorrow, not in a year or two, but like from my perspective, it's like, okay, we're at X percent of students reading at grade level. We're at X percent this. We would like to get to 5% better right? And these are the things that we're going to do to get there. And so for me, when I think of a goal, that's what I'm looking for is like, you know, here's the goal and here's the steps I'm going to get there. And so I am just having a lot of trouble kind of like understanding the metrics behind them and understanding like, and then if we're going to then throw it to all 19 schools and all 19 schools are going to have like unique outcomes and all that stuff, it's like, well, how does it all funnel up? Um, and so just to be quite honest, like I'm struggling with that, mm -hmm. truthfully. And then um, uh, what, what, at a minimum, as long as like, if there's going to be accountability, that's great. But then um, my next question is, is with the third grade benchmark, um, state testing doesn't, isn't for third grade, correct? Isn't it fourth grade and above? So how will the students be monitored at the end of third grade? Yeah, third, third grade third grade kids are, are assessed. Um, okay. But, okay. So we have internal mechanisms as, as well that we look at uh, because if you think about it, you don't, you don't typically want to wait until the standardized test assessment test, the results lag, or you'll get the results the next year. Or so it's often difficult to actually do anything about the problem. So you'll see it's academic education language that's written in here, but like um, the reference to like formative assessments those are those are tools that we utilize to to understand um, the level of learning that children are able to demonstrate, and then teachers use that information to build future lessons and instruction and things along those lines. Um, I have a background in business as well. I actually have a bachelor's degree in, in business management, a concentration small business management, and and have been trained through executive leadership training and and things along those lines. And think the same way. I guess if you think of in terms of a board of directors, board of directors probably wouldn't be able to establish the specific measures, but would be able to be able to establish and say the expectation is that we are going to make X amount of progress and growth, but but within um, specific department or strand, they they can actualize um, the, quant the the quantifiable figures and numbers. I can tell you the administrators have begun the process already of looking at these goals and working on them. I'll be able to share with you another document that directly links to this that's more listed in an action plan format. So we have action plans are for the schools to implement and to actualize that's what's, what's been established. But as, as the Board of Education, it's, it's important to establish this, this overarching expectation and vision uh, for what it is that we expect to see. You mentioned your, your daughter, um, you'll see listed within here references to uh, the New Jersey tiered system of supports that speaks directly to what you're saying directly to, to what you're saying. Now, it's broad. There's a specific application at the school level and the school may say, we're gonna implement a, a multi-tiered multi system of supports and have the basic skills reading teacher provide supports for any child who demonstrates um, reading a grade level or below or something along those lines. And then they'll have a specific measure that's built in to ascertain growth for those particular children as well. But but that's, that's how it, it, it lays out. Um, you will see those documents. I just don't have them yet. 
So we have to go through the process of having this approved first, and then that's the next the next piece of it. So, you know, and I sort of apologize. Like, so in my mind, I I can clearly see the, the entire process. I know where it starts and where it, where it ends, but I can't show that show you that and share that until. And just to just having you know gone through this for a couple of years, so Dr. Morton, the board establishes the goals, right? We have to adopt these goals before the the principals cannot work on implementation plans until we've adopted the goals. Um, and they take this exactly. and they move forward. And then that work continues on in the committee, most heavily in CNI is where we probably see most yeah, of it. I was but, just going to say to clarify. Sorry, I just want to clarify. Oh, just ahead. finish. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll pitch it to you right after. But um, and then we start and we get throughout the year, we get presentations from the principals about um, both full board presentations and also in committees. So that's something that you'll see, uh, Mrs. Gallagher, you know, we, in the past year we've had it, it'll continue. So the implementation, we'll, we will start to see the linkages. So um, Mrs. Winters, I just wanted to finish. Sorry, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to say, Ms. Gallagher, I think you know, I understand what you're saying. And I think in my mind, the way I differentiate it, the way I've come to understand it is that we don't do the how it gets implemented. That's not the board's role. That's the administration's role and the principal's role to do that how piece that you're talking about, those to get more in the weeds. So we are at this level right now adopting the goals for the 23-24 year. Then they do their work and then they will report back to us through the mechanism of the committee process. So through CNI. And since you're not currently on CNI, my job is going to be to make sure that you are continually informed about this implementation process going forward, what that looks like, those specific details that you're looking for are coming. But as Ms. Stern said, those are sort of the next steps. And that's not that's not work that we do as a board. That's what they do. And then they report back to us. And then we collaborate with them in seeing how things are going and moving forward. So I think that's the process piece of it that gets to what you're saying. It's not all at once in one big chunk today. This is step one of a multi-step process going forward. So if you feel like you need that more, that feedback loop, that's something that I'm really interested in too. Um, through CNI, and that's something that we've started to work on together as the CNI committee, the four of us, is working on when we get information back, that analysis piece of it, of the what's working, what's not, how can we improve, and how can we support it. And to speak to your concerns about budgetary things, that's how we got to some of the budgetary pieces we added this year, was that we asked the experts, like, here are, this is where we see as a board, sky high level, where the deficits are. We see this and we see this. How can we better support learning and math? Because math seems to be a piece that we were working on. So we did a bunch of things through CNI, including the implementation of the Eureka Math Squared pilot, which is coming this fall, including the addition of the math coaches, the splitting of the math supervisors into two positions. Those all have budgetary implications, but they were based on the feedback that we get from administration to target those things towards achieving our goals. So I'm hoping that I, as hopefully I continue as CNI chair, but I don't know, Ms. Stern, but um, I hope to. I hope to, that you'll see more of that coming through. I mean, I think for me, one of the major pieces, and I just want to bring it out again, was that this work from CNI, the CNI pieces of this started in January. And so it's been eight months of working towards this piece, this product. And I hope that that work that we all put in, me, Ms. Stern, Selmer Stratton, Dr. Rude, along partnering with the administration. I hope that comes through in the way that these are articulated. But like you, I'm excited to see the next steps going forward and also how that translates into budgetary priorities for next year. Dr. Rood? Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things. First of all, I, I like the repackaging of the goals and I I especially appreciate the amount that the administration and board worked together this year to kind of put the goals together. I, I worked on the goals heavily last year and felt like there was a little bit of a disconnect where we weren't connecting well with our admin team. Um, and I think that's a real improvement this year that, that the team working on the goals really worked hand in hand. Um, I hope I hope you agree with that statement, but it, it seems like it was a better process and came up. And I think you guys came up with a really nice product. Um, I also wanted to um, 
comment on um because mrs gallagher because you mentioned it and also um in a, a public comment i kind of wanted to because i'm in line with that wanting to see very specific data i pushed for that a lot last year and i i've kind of my opinion on data has maybe evolved a little bit and so i want to offer an alternative vision for why i really appreciate the kind of just putting in you know 100 percent of students will um you know so this isn't refuting your i think you're right seeing the data is great at a more granular level but in this document i appreciate those numbers because like when i when i really dive in and think about what our goal should be it is to get 100 percent of kids there and we it's true we are going to be hard pressed to ever do a, get a hundred percent of kids to do anything um just natural differences in ability make that really hard but the goal should be a hundred percent and if we put in numbers that are like well you know 88 percent of kids on the ela test are at you know graduation readiness but we want to push that to 90 well what if we have a crop of kids that just happens to be like entirely academically brilliant and they're scoring a hundred percent on all EL, ELA and math stuff. That's awesome. And they're all going to pass that and we're going to get a hundred percent on that number. But is, is that even meaningful? That just happens to be an aberration in that group of kids. And maybe the next group of kids will be the complete opposite coming from disadvantaged backgrounds where they don't have access to materials and they underperform. In our data, we see that oftentimes people from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, do kind of underperform compared to the average. And, and so if, if that's the case with another group of kids and now we're way below our benchmark, have we, have we failed or is that, so, so I think that like our definition of failure becomes kind of irrelevant in that, in that argument. So I like having the, I like the way things have been worded, but what I'm really excited about, and I think this speaks to your point, is, is this kind of dashboarding for individual schools and kind of looking at incremental progress of, you know, classes as they move forward. And, you know, the, the, ultimately we have to follow each kid. We want to see improvement in each kid, um, in each school. And can we see that incremental progress. Um, I think that kind of coming up with uh, unique and creative ways of dashboarding the data will be really helpful for the community to see the more granular stuff. But on the big level, I've had a shift in my own views and appreciate this more just like wholesale. Like our goal is everybody. We're not going to get there, but that's not a failure. We're going to do our best with each individual kid. Um, so that's the second comment I want to make, and I one more thing, um, Mrs. Fleischer said something about a living document, and I think that that's important, not just for the board and the admin, but also for the community. We had some comments in first um, public comment tonight about, you know, well, I don't think you should approve because, well, this isn't in it, or that's different, or, well, you know, for all of for, for all of the armchair quarterbacks out there, this is you know throughout the year you have an opportunity to talk to your board members and say, hey, in the goals, you know, last year you didn't really have a focus on this. You know, do you you know maybe a focus on that you know in the next set of goals would be useful or you know we can't have everything in the goals or it becomes an exhaustive like an, an untenable document that we can't focus on everything and. But it, but it, but like Mrs. Fleischer said, it's a living document. It we're going to update this every year. That gives us an opportunity to see what worked, what didn't. Was this a good, you know, was our focus on this, you know, effective, or, or should you know we now, you know, maybe we don't want to focus on that because we're doing pretty good there, but we want to focus on this other thing. So there's always an opportunity for feedback and for people to kind of, you know, you know, if you think we've missed something, then then you know, send your comments. Uh, to the board, to the administration, and the the you know good I but come with come with um you know positive and constructive feedback so that we you know if if you just if we just hear complaints it's really hard to incorporate change but 
if we get good ideas and good constructive feedback, that's the kind of thing that can really fuel improvement in these goals year from year to year. So I think that's really important for the community to, to realize that that's, that's where they can play a role is providing feedback on these goals and, and giving their opinions there. So those are just the, some things that I've been reflecting on here. Thank you, Dr. Rood. Further questions from any of the board members? And I'm actually going to throw it back to you, Dr. Rood. Okay. Well, in, in that case, um, we'll move the agenda. So um, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following, 18.1, 2023-2024 approval of district goals. Um, are there any further questions or comments? Seeing none, if you could move the vote, Ms. Sugars. Or, oh, I need a second, but uh, Mrs. Winters. Um, okay, now questions, comments, right? Seeing none, if you could open the voting, Mrs. Sugars, thank you. Can you please? Yes, to everything. Thank you. Okay, we have um, five yes votes and one no vote, Mrs. Gallagher. Okay, and then we have move on to new business. Is there any new business to discuss this evening? Okay, and then we move on to old business. Does anybody have any old business to discuss this evening? This evening. Okay. Oh, Mrs. Chick, uh, Mrs. Tong. Uh, yes, I, I don't know if it's still old or new, but I'm still uh, pressing on the student comments. And when we're going to start that, um, I guess stop starting September, we'd like to see that uh, change so that the student will be ready when they do make comments. Thank you. So I'm glad you brought that up. So last time at our last meeting, we, you know, we brought up the idea of, um, potentially moving to a first public comment period that would be um, for any topic with students starting out at the beginning of the meeting, right, after our roll call. So that's something that we proposed, um, making that change. I, I thought I initiated that idea, right? A after all the, the, you know, ongoing discussion, I think it's time to take some, make some change. However, I... I Feel like where I sit and I'm open to, you know, conversation, but, you know, there are uh, quite a few of us absent tonight. And I feel like it's, you know, it, one thing to discuss it, it's another thing to kind of, you know, make a change. I feel like we probably should make a change when there are more of us here. This is kind of a, a big decision. It's about the structure of our meeting. So are you, as my thinking, I don't know, Mrs. Tong, if that's okay with you, if other people have any thoughts about that, but um, before we finalize any, you know, discussion about it. Yes, that's okay with me. Thank you, Mr. Okay, so why don't we put that on for next time and we'll kind of revisit it next time. Is that okay? Great, thanks. No, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a good, no, it's an important, it's a very important topic for student, you know, student voice and overall public comment. So, okay. Any other I just uh, do want to mention, um, I guess, officially on the record, just an acknowledgement that, you know, we have all this fantastic construction work going on. Um, it's also creates a lot of pain points. You know, there's just a lot of disruption that goes on when you do construction. And I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, I know that Mrs. Sugars and Dr. Morton um, and their teams are working very, very, very hard to ensure that the construction is finishing up in a timely manner and is not, and is as minimally disruptive as possible to our uh, students and staff and faculty um, and community. Although that is probably asp more aspirational than realistic to think that that's always gonna be the case. Um, but I think there's been a tremendous push to do a lot 
with as minimal problems as possible. And where there have been problems, there have been quick responsive remediation. So I just want to, again, acknowledge that. Mrs. Sugars, I hope you can feel like you can take a little bit of a rest maybe in September. <laughs> uh, maybe September 2027. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I just also want to say, you know, we have had, I mean, in-depth conversations, you know, throughout the summer and obviously prior about the challenges Dr. Morton has kept us appraised of, um, you know, different things going on and the, the steps to take in to solve them. Um, it's been hard. It's going to get harder. It's, and it's going to happen every summer and throughout the year. Um, and there's been a, a huge already lots of lessons learned. There's, um, you know, greater understanding of what's needed, of what works, of what doesn't work. There's a greater understanding of, um, who are more reliable and maybe less reliable, you know, folks to work with along the way. Um, and, uh, I just really, you know, the summer is kind of a, perhaps a little bit of a step back for us board members. It's not as intense. We don't have as many, you know, there's, we're just, there's just not as much for us to engage in, which is kind of a nice break. It's been the, um, the exact opposite for Mrs. Sugar's um, and I would say, you know, Dr. Morton and your crew, I mean, it's just, it's a lot. So thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you to the community for your patience. Um, we're not done saying thank you. Cause that's gonna, it's gonna take a long time. Um, I'm it's fantastic to see what's happening and what's going to be better, but it's hard to get there. So I think that's it for old business. Um, and, uh, we move now to Second public comment. Second public comment um, is an opportunity for community members to comment on any matters relevant to our operations of Cherry Hill Public School District or within the authority of Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on relevant matters and under established law, federal uh, law governing reasonable restrictions on speech and public forums, statements which demean individual community members or groups or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district are or repetitious uh, will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent, board of education president, all board members via email or other alternative means. Um, and uh, I want to thank Matt for attending tonight as he finishes out his summer break before he officially starts school. And also Dr. Rood um, uh, is on his way to, what is it? He is going to be the fourth, <laughs> right? One, two, three, fourth board member to drop a student off to college. Um, so thank you. So he needed to skedaddle for that. Get on the road. All right. Uh, if you would like to speak now, uh, please state your name and your municipality. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak and the timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. And we will start in the room. Hi, my name is Lisa Kahn, uh, Cherry Hill. And um, I was a board member here in Cherry Hill 2007 through 2010, I believe. And um, I came tonight because um, in preparation for the upcoming superintendent search, there's, uh, or I was invited to be part of a focus group. And I thought, boy, I better find out what's going in the on in the schools so I can address, address it intelligently. So I just want to say I'm so thrilled to see this board is um, so thoughtful, um, is working so hard, and um, communicates so nicely together. It really was a pleasure to see and to see Dr. Morton with his um, deep understanding and knowledge of the district. It was a very nice experience tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you for being part of the focus group. We appreciate it. Okay. And now we go online and uh, Carolina Bevid uh, is the first hand up. I'm Carolina Bevid, Cherry Hill. 
Uh, Mrs. Stern, as an educator, I would like to respectfully disagree with you a bit about the lecture you gave on the importance of SEL in our schools. Yes, while conflict resolution and interpersonal relationships are certainly important, those are skills that can be learned outside of school, as well as within the course of a normal school day. Social and emotional skills are learned among families, with siblings, during sports, or just hanging out casually with friends, and often they're best learned without adult intervention. Teachers should set and maintain behavioral norms and expectations, and then school time should be dedicated to academic learning. Targeted SEL support should be given to students who exhibit a specific need. I am certain that if a therapy practice started focusing on patients' algebra skills, the patients would be rightfully dissatisfied. I know Dr. Ruta has left, but I would like to address him and say that I don't think it's very respectful to call commenters armchair quarterbacks, but um, his advice about giving constructive feedback leads me to my next point. I've repeatedly expressed my concern about computer usage in elementary school, and I fear that another year is upon us without any progress. If teachers are not given comprehensive tools and guidelines to teach computer etiquette, internet safety, and how to type in a proficient way, you're already not achieving the board goals because kids who can't type are not well prepared for post-secondary success. I hope that this is addressed or is being addressed and something will be rolled out soon. Thank you. Okay, go back to the room. Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill. Um, I, I know math, but 17.4, the vote was two yes, two no, two abstentions, three people not here, so five abstentions, and 17.5, the motion carries. Um, I'm confused that two yes votes carries a motion. Full day preschool was mentioned. Um, I had a child attend full day preschool this past year, five and a half hours. This coming school year, the school day will be six hours um, with a 45 minute rest period. My child who attended for five and a half hours is now losing 15 minutes of educational instruction, um, totaling 45 and a half hours, seven days and three and a half hours of lost educational instruction. So even though we are increasing the school day for most preschoolers, it's not all preschoolers. And, um, my child is being cheated out of 15 minutes a day for 182 school days. Yesterday, I received an email that the back to school forms are available to be filled out online. I have five students registered in this district and five times I had to say, that I'm not affiliated with the military, that I approve and have read the free lunch app process form, that I've read the student code of conduct. Um, all of those forms should be per family, not per student, because anyone who has more than one child in the district had to fill out that form more than once. Um, the nurse record form, um, except for medication and specific to student needs, should be a form for families, not for students. Um, I filled out my children's doctors five times. Uh, the medication authorization form asks for medication the child takes, but so does the nurse record form. So I had to submit it twice. Um, I filled out all of the forms. I didn't see a computer waiver form. I do not approve for my children to bring home computers. And I want to make sure that that doesn't happen because last year, um, I filled out that they could not bring them home and yet computers came home for them, um, including before summer break. And I said, bring your computer back to school so that it doesn't come home for the summer. And my child cried because her teacher told her she had to bring it home, but I didn't approve for it to come home. Um, and then finally, I filled out all of the forms. And that gives anyone access to Genesis who was blocked if they hadn't filled out the forms. So although I'm in a happy marriage and I'm happy to let my husband see Genesis, that's not true for everyone in the school district. And so anyone who has a login to Genesis should have to approve that they agree with the forms that were filled out because otherwise one parent is doing all of the work and parents that aren't involved in their kids' lives are not. Thank you. Okay. And we go to the phone number ending with 891 on the line. My name is Jeff Pop. 
My name is Jeff Potterworth, and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I am referring to the paper, Specific Learning Disabilities, Evaluating Principles and Standards the LD, from the LD Institute, Learning Disabilities Association of America, and the University of Arizona, SAALT SALT Center, 2023. Despite, it says, states, despite clear policy in the U.S., persistently low student achievement data indicate that little progress has been made towards meeting the instructional needs of students with, with SLD, specific learning disability. Too many students are not properly evaluated or when evaluated show little response to the resulting interventions. Too many evaluations provide little guidance for educators to address the students' difficulties. Students with SLD represent 32% of the K-12 students with this disability population. The purpose of, of these new inter, inter, interdisciplinary principles and standards is to provide a guide for best practices in the evaluation and identification of SLD. Now, page 34 in the appendix, Four. It's worthwhile reading, reading, by the way, that document. Now, page 34, appendix four of this document, titled Disability, Not Just a Difference. The paper gives an example. A functional impairment, such as processing deficit in phonological processing and rapid autonomic naming, can indicate the presence of a specific reading disability, result, resulting in a significant restriction of the activity of reading. This inability to read may result in participation restrictions and become a handicap if the person cannot be provided with accommodations as well as appropriate interventions. All right, parents, okay, this is a worthwhile read for parents with, with the understanding that as a matter of public record, an individual, an individual in the Cherry Hill School District has been in effect forced by our Cherry Hill School District to file complaints, that's plural complaints, with a, with a U.S. Office of Civil Rights to obtain accommodations for individuals with disabilities so that these disabilities do not become a participation restriction, therefore becoming a handicap. Parents need to educate themselves about IEPs and 504s, written goals, et cetera. I believe CHEP, the Charitable Special Aid PTA, may help them. This looks with, okay, and so, in other words, goals on IEPs already are not being, being adhered to by the Cherry Hill School District. So, um, yeah, your goals. Those goals are important. Also, personally, I could certainly... Okay, Dr. Potterwitz, thank you. The, Dr. Potterwitz, okay. I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. Ann Einhorn, Cherry Hill, we have a deal. Um, I, I wanna go back to 17.4 as well, because I'm really confused. There were two no's, two abstentions, um, and two yeses. So is it, a, is it the majority of the board members president, present? Because you only had six tonight. So I, 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 we really need to have that looked into by Paul Green. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure that that yeah. was, thank you. I, I think there's a real concern with that. Um, I, I listened to your goals. I kind of briefly read them. Um, my biggest concern moving forward is how are you going to support, how are you going to support the staff in our district? Because we have not been supporting them. How do you support the teacher that's picking up two extra math classes at High School West? You know, with abundant, well, our classes aren't as large as the ones at East. How are you supporting the kids in elementary school whose classes are at maximum? How are you supporting that teacher? It goes just, it goes beyond what your goals say. You must support these teachers. We have not been doing that, in my opinion, for the last two years since we've come back into school. They are suffering as much as the students. Um, I, I listen with some intrigue. Uh, maybe one of your goals should have been lowering elementary class size. The building-based strategies should really have a commonality or consistency amongst all 12 elementary, all three middle schools, and all three high schools. We've run into problems with this year in and year out. One principal does this, one principal does that. I don't care what they do, 
but we should have very much similar outcomes, regardless of what side of town that that school sits in. And I, I'm very much intrigued. I mean, I haven't heard anything through CNI, but the Department of Education on July the 28th put out a high impact tutoring notice of grant opportunity specifically for third and fourth graders. And I haven't heard one word through CNI at all about this program. Um, considering that we do have students that have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, have we filed for this? It's only good for one year. So Dr. Morton, with, with your um, permission, I will hand it to you. And as you look for the superintendent, and I know that's what you're doing, will there be more than just BOE members at the final interview? Um, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, when Dr. Rushi was hired, we didn't just have BOE members, we also had members of the administrative staff, the teachers union, et cetera. So I'm just curious to see as you move forward with the search, how you'll be handling this, but not just BOE members. Thank you. Okay, and we go back online. And um, Penny Nimitz, you are the next public comment. Uh, Dr. Penny Nimitz, Sherry Hill. I'd like to comment on um, section 18, strategic planning and goals, district goals. I do not see anything in the goals that speaks to academics. Um, I hear about wellness and passion and purpose and voices and connecting beyond our classrooms. But after two years of learning loss, significant learning loss, um, aren't there your experts advising you that you should really focus on academics and not on emotional um, content? Uh, the kids are anxious. They've been through a lot. Where is the focus on math, on reading and writing? I'm not seeing it on any of the goals. Second question, I understand the agenda that you have um, a liaison for homeless students. Uh, can you provide data how many homeless students are involved and how do they get enrolled in uh, Cherry Hill? Where do they come from and how do we care for them? And what is the actually impact uh, on class uh, affairs such as learning environments, are the students in the classrooms and how we're dealing with their emotional needs uh, in the schools. Um, what is the definition of a homeless? Is, is um, uh, um, an undocumented child is also uh, uh, included in that category of homelessness? Are there undocumented children in Cherry Hill School? We'd like to know if this is happening um, and please provide us the data. Uh, I also would like to know if the Board of Ed agrees uh, with Attorney Gen uh, General Platkin uh, that um, the teaching staff at Cherry Hill School is obligated to keep secrets from parents. Uh, I need to understand if the Board of Ed of Cherry Hill agrees with Attorney uh, Platkin's position um, that parents should not be informed uh, if their child is saying things in secret uh, to teachers or to school personnel, um, what we would call trusted adults, uh, in without the knowledge of parents. And if that is so, um, how is the board responding to it? And do parents, are parents aware in Cherry Hill schools that the schools are keeping secrets from them? Um, I think the, the, and we need to understand if the Board of Ed is supportive of parents and the parents' authority over the entire education of the child during the classroom hours and days, or are parents not entitled to know what is the child doing in the classroom? Thank you. We go to the room. Rick Short, Cherry Hill. Uh, Madam President, Ms. Gallagher, uh, my question for you uh, is some bond questions. Uh, the first bond question is this. Um, it's really not a design question. I mean, have you seen Cherry Hill West with the uh, awning? It looks like a George Jetson uh, takeoff uh, vehicle. Have you looked at the uh, building of the uh, APs, each costing $3.6 million? They look like they're pole barns. Uh, they don't match the uh, existing school. Uh, they have no natural light. Uh, they have no, which means also means that they need films on them. So how, um, how building efficient is this to have a pole barn 
Uh, have you reviewed the information I sent you from the New York City uh, schools about efficiency of building plan? Because that building that's designed does not look efficient at all. And I wish that they would take half of the building and match at least the brick. So it kind of matches and it doesn't look like a, like a pole barn. Um, let's move on to the uh, student uh, wellness and all this stuff. You guys run around here like a, uh, like, like, like a mouse wheel and, and you don't even realize the problem. I wanna share an email from Dr. Uh, Malash where he said of the 72 grade levels, K-5 at 12, around 20 of them currently are at capacity. So what you have is you have your Portland dress code. Uh, I, I went to the school one time, Madam President was there. And my, my daughter uh, gave me a beautiful letter and I noticed girls walking around in fishnet stockings, the regular, uh, the regular uh, hoodies on with the AirPods. So you have a bad dress policy. You have teachers that are overloaded with, with kids and you guys are trying to re redraw goals, which aren't gonna matter because our poor teachers can't teach because they're at 26 or 28 kids and they're telling you there's a problem and you're not taking care of it. So that's your biggest problem in this district. It isn't about how you write your goals or you kind of create your own insanity. Finally, uh, Mur uh, Governor Murphy just called uh, uh, on July 23rd, just said on uh, Meet the Nation that we're in a culture war in schools. So I guess the, the one question comes down to is what is the future? The future of Cherry Hill schools, will it be a, a superintendent that doesn't lie? It's a pretty serious question. I've talked about applause suppression. There's been denials that it happens. We know both President Trump, President Biden lie. So I asked Dr. Morton, is applause oppression going to continue in this district? Is somebody going to fess up or not? Thank you, Mr. Short. Okay, we go back to the line. And L.A., if you could please state your full name and your municipality. Yes, Laurie Neary, Cherry Hill. I wanted to speak one regarding much of the comments around some of the goals and concerns. Um, I, I just want to put it out there. Maslow's hierarchy, a scared kid won't learn. A hungry kid won't learn. So we absolutely have to go back to the basics if we want them to somehow not only learn, but excel as well. Um, so that has to come first and foremost, for sure. Second, with regard to the questions other board members had with the goals, um, very important to understand how the goal relates to any measures if, if they're there. That's not asking the how, it's trying to understand the relationship between the two if it exists. So if you have a goal regarding student discipline, the activities under it may look like professional development for staff, referral of students to other programs versus out of school suspension. And then the measure would look like a reduction in the number of suspensions of students, disparate or otherwise. Really basic, but there's a measure, right? And it's something to look to without going granular in the data or crossing over a line of what a board member should request, right? Pretty clear cut. And, and frankly, I, I, something based on the goals that I read that we should be looking at. Um, also, I had a question regarding the approval of staff for West for Saturday detentions. Um, I'm going to guess that both high schools will attend one high school for Saturday suspensions. But how does that play with the goals? Is that helping us meet a reduction in that discipline? Something uh, to look deeper into. And regarding the NJGPA, in looking at the data for students with disabilities, a narrative that needs to be thought about or changed, when you look at those numbers, right, and whether it's 14 students, one student, 200 students, it's if they're not meeting the criteria, it's one student too many. And we need to look at it and say, or the administration, right, because it's going to be data that the board wouldn't have. But if a student isn't intellectually disabled, 
then I would look to the numbers and say, if they can't meet the criteria, then perhaps we are not accommodating and modifying the curriculum appropriately for them to succeed. And we should be looking at that in detail. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to the room. Uh, you and me are still Cherry Hill. Um, my district uses something called operational norms and we start every meeting with it. I will say it's gotten a little repetitive after two days and having it repeated, but it actually makes a really good sense. And two of them came to mind just that they're easy to remember or is tech use is appropriate and we start and end on time. Um, it's just more of them, I'll email them to Dr. Morton. It's really helpful just in terms of having goals, but also what are our normative operations and standards? And it's also given to us to use in the classroom. Um, the candidate form is currently scheduled for the second day of Sukkot, uh, which is a Jewish holiday. The board has had a good tradition of moving meetings to start after sunset when Jewish holidays ended. They did it three years ago or four years ago for the one of the last bond votes so that people could attend. If that meeting could start at eight o'clock so that it can be inclusive and that no one's worrying about uh, sunset and things like that, it's a very important election and we should be as inclusive as possible. I agree with uh, former board member Lori Neary in terms of Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, students entire needs need to be taken care of if we don't take care of them as a whole person they're not going to do any better uh, when it comes to setting expectations i know we talked about 100 percent, but if we don't set that high goal students are going to feel like they're falling through the cracks that we need to aim high are we always going to hit it no but we have to set the aspiration i think also now that we have the goals in place i hope that their action plan is set up to enable the successful operationalizing of those goals um, and also, um, going back to our lovely topic of data, are we looking at the cross-sectionality of students? So, for example, do we take an African-American male who also is in, ID'd as a special education student and looking at that sub-demographic of seeing those two or more IDs? Because I'd be very curious to break out that data, because I know in my district, that is one of our most marginalized students. And one of those students, we're trying to look at interventions to be able to make sure that we're targeting and really working to improve them. But their identity is not just whether they are African-American, but they're also a student who requires additional support in the classroom. And if you lose one of those identities, we're not serving the whole student. Thank you. Okay. We go back to the line for line for Jim Neary. Hi, Jim Neary, Cherry Hill. Um, I'm glad I wasn't the only one who caught it. I also wanted to point out the question on 17.4, where it appeared that you had two abstentions, two no votes and two yes votes. So I'm glad that um, I did hear you say that that was being looked into by Mr. Green. Um, my other comment was, I think we need to also look at the way you call out the votes at the end, because at the end of 17, um, Ms. Sugars said, except for the exceptions noted, it was a unanimous yes vote. Well, however, if anyone's listening to the actual yeses and nos, many times these votes are anything but a unanimous yes vote because you ask for the abstentions or the nos ahead of time. But by calling it a unanimous yes vote, except for the nos, is a very disingenuous way to report how a vote actually went. Rather than just an Orwellian blanket, it was a yes, we should actually call it out either by item if it was unanimous or not unanimous, or at minimum just report it how it's actually voted versus everything being other than the exceptions noted, it was a unanimous vote. Because that's it seems very disingenuous and doesn't represent the community the way the board that they've elected is actually voting. So it may not give people the faith that they're looking for. Thank you. Okay, come back to the room. Howard Yaris, Cherry Hill. In hearing the discussion of this year's goals, I would have liked to have heard a comparison to last year's by achievements. Did we achieve last year's goals? When I brought up this year's goals and last year's goals on my computer, I couldn't run a comparison because this year's format is so much better. But I would love to see some kind of comparison. Did we meet those goals? The other thing we've talked about inclusivity, and I'm going to mention this October 1st, to me a problem with the time. We cannot afford as a district to miss dotting an I or crossing a T when it regards people's religion, culture, or anything like that. There can be no room for error. We must have calendars that are accurate, that are show up these dates that are concerned to others so we do have a united community. Thank you. Okay, 
Uh, no more hands online. No more, no more people at the podium. So I will close public comment. Uh, and we will move to, um, I don't know if there are any superintendent comments tonight. So Dr. Morton. Yeah, just a, just a couple comments. Um, I want to thank the board again for um, the approval of the goals. It gives us an opportunity now to move forward in the process and, and to begin to build upon, um, upon what's been established. Um, I'm proud of the information that's been included. I'm proud of the process that's been taken. Um, I clearly envision and see where this is going to take us and where this, where this is going to go. Um, and, it, and this will be um, the platform in which we will build and build, you know, lines of academic achievement and greater communities and greater culture across the district. So I'm, I'm very confident in that and um, definitely can envision that that endpoint. And um, I'm looking forward to, to being able to share that and sharing the process with you all. Um, Ms. Einhorn, thank you for the information about high impact tutoring. We've had internal discussions about it. Um, the information that's been shared is something that obviously that we're definitely looking uh, forward to seeing if we can tap into these funds as well. Um, we've had more conversation about goals and preschool expansion and, and grants along those lines. So we haven't had a conversation as much about um, just this just yet, but it's a, it provides a tremendous opportunity for us. So thank you for that. Uh, there was a question about Saturday detention at the high school level and staff being approved. Typically, um, the entire staff is approved to pr provide um, any type of detention, whether it be after school or on Saturday at each of the high schools. So the, the, high, the entire staff of both high schools will be approved at some point by the board. It happens every year. It is a measure that's listed within our, our approved code of conduct, student code of conduct. So, so it is used um, rather than an exclusive type of practice to, to send a child out of school on suspension. Um, again, thank you to the board. Thank you to the administrative team for your work and working together on the goals. Um, we're definitely looking forward to, to building upon that and reporting that on the success. Thank you, Dr. Morton. And, um... I also just want to make a comment. I want to, um, you know, thank the community for um, uh, the question about the vote. And I want to let the board know that Mr. Green has weighed in. He is online. He just wasn't here in person tonight. Um, and he has um, recommended uh, or advised us um, that we will uh, vote next time. So we will revote to clarify um, because Dr. Rude um, had to leave. We don't have the opportunity to do it tonight. So um, we want to uh, have an accurate vote. So we will, um, uh, that will be um, put to next meeting, Mrs. Sugars. So, um, so thank you for an astute and tuned in community. Um, and that's it. That's my only other uh, comment. So I will make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second, Mrs. Pleasure? All in favor? All in favor? Okay, <laughs> good, everybody, motion carries. <laughs>